Hey guys, welcome to Better Together with me, Maria Menounos. When you know better, you get better, and that's what we do here every day. It is Tuesday, May 26th, 2020. Holy moly, the year's almost over. <laughs> Our guest today is Dr. Pamela Peek. I'm so excited for her. She's a New York Times bestselling author known for her advances in studies of uh, integrative and preventative medicine. Um, we're going to be talking to her all about stress management today and nutrition and a lot of very important things medically to help us. A uh, little TM, a little meditation as well. Very excited to bring that to you. Our quote of the day, take care of your body. It's the only place you have to live. Jim Rohn. So we are starting a new format today. We're checking out a new way to do this rather than rolling in that big long intro we used to roll in. Um, we are getting right to it. Hopefully you guys like that. Let me know. Uh, if you haven't joined us at Patreon, please do click the link in the summary and come in at whatever you can. Uh, we're doing really cool shows over there that I think you'll love and will find very useful in your journey to getting better. Um, yeah. I kind of like this, yeah. like new, just get to it. Just get the music, keep going, going, going. Yeah, I think so. Jeff Scam. Miss Marie Menounos. Did you have a great Memorial Day weekend? I got to say, made some coconut shrimp yesterday. Oh, geez, really? Yeah, they were pretty <gasps> good. I, I'm going to make them again, and I'll bring some in. Yeah, you keep saying you're going to bring food in, and you bring food for yourself and not for the rest of us. I know, shame on me. Well, I am, I'm definitely going to do it again. I use coconut mana. And co like toasted coconut flakes and grilled. I was, gotta say, pretty impressed with myself. It was, uh, I'm learning how to cook, which is I'm fun. I'm really hungry right now. Do you know who else is making shrimp? Was uh, Annie from 90 Day Fiance. She's doing this, like, she's launching this whole cooking business. You could be like Annie, or maybe I, you'll learn from Annie. I aspire to be like the people on 90 Day Fiance. That is, is my dream. <laughs> is she doing like the, what is it, the forest, forest Gump thing? Bubba, Bubba Gumps? I've never seen it. What? I know. Oh, that'll be a good movie night, actually. I've never seen Forrest Gump. You'll love it. It's great. I, yeah. am, I mean, I, I consider myself bad at seeing movies, and yeah. I saw it like two years ago for the first time. Oh, boy. I can't believe you haven't seen it. I know. I haven't seen a lot of things. I was busy working. But um, coconut shrimp. Okay, so can I ask a question? Because I just started making shrimp in quarantine, and I feel like I'm intimidated by shrimp. I, I find shrimp easy because it's fast. You just have to be quick on it. Um, do you do you usually get like uncooked and then, you know, you de-bone de it or whatever? De-vein. De-vein. De-vein it, de yes. your own shrimp? Yeah, because the kind that I get from Ralph's, like, you need to do it yourself. So, so what do you do? You pull out like the... Well, it's this easy peel. It's like the easy peel shrimp. So you, it really just comes off easily. And then they're super fresh when you make them. And yeah, like on a grill or a pan, it's like three minutes aside. And the way you can tell is they turn pink. And that's how you know. Well, I'm Ooh. screwed then. I'm colorblind. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> it's always been so difficult to cook shrimp. But now I realize why. Well, I've used the frozen kind, right? Yeah. And I, I feel like I just have never really learned my mom never really made shrimp so i never really learned that um but i like shrimp a lot yeah i think like i've become a big fan of getting meat like behind the counter at the grocery store and what's nice is it's yeah. frozen and you know you know it's hopefully safe and um yeah it just tastes extra fresh that way so you can just get jumbo shrimp they're usually mm. on sale and um yeah it was really really good i was uh Sounds pat so myself on the back good you know what i discovered this weekend was and in the last like let's say week or so our grill is being serviced and so i've realized that cooking on a grill isn't as good i know this is gonna sound controversial as cooking on your stovetop grill like i have a stovetop grill and i've been making cheeseburgers i made you your cheeseburger on the stovetop grill Right. Like if you have, you know, right over here, my demos that I made the tortillas with, it's like a Wolfgang Puck plug in grill um, or, you know, my stove has one already built in cooking the burgers there. The juices all stay right there and doesn't drip down through the grill. And that's why I have to 
you know, replace all my burners now probably because all the juices destroyed it. But we made carne asada yesterday in the oven. Okay, normally I grow carne asada. I wouldn't think to like cook it in the oven. On a pan, all the juice was right there. It was unreal. Sounds so good. I love carne asada. Did you guys do tacos or? No, we just did carne asada. And then my dad sliced potatoes and we um, put them in the convention oven and made them really crispy with a lot of salt and pepper and garlic. Mm, That's so good. So they were almost like potato chips, but they were still a little mushy in the middle, crispy on the outside. Damn. Was that your Memorial Day? That was yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we yeah. Uh, we grilled at the house. We grilled, but I I think that there's something to be said about grilling with charcoal versus grilling with propane in terms yeah. of like the juices on the oven. Like that definitely adds more flavor than like grilling it if you're gonna use propane. But the charcoal flavor when you have burgers and hot dogs. Yeah. And we made uh, corn on the cob where you throw uh you put the cob in in uh, foil with some garlic butter. And yeah. some oil and some salt and pepper. And then you just throw that on a grill and leave it on the grill for like 10 minutes, 15 minutes on each side. Oh, my God. Delicious. So good. Yeah, I think I think that's where we're missing out. We don't have a coal grill. We have, yeah. you know, a propane grill. But, man, you had my burger. The my burger, burger was good. good. I had your hot dog burger. Hot dog version. Because hot I thought burger. I didn't have any more buns. And you know what? I did. But let me be honest, <laughs> that was actually a thing, Maria. That was what? like a th- so like Maria made me a burger, right? But two. she cut she made me two burgers. Mm-hmm. She cut the patty in half and then put it on the hot dog bun. Yep. And I gotta be honest, I like ripped the hot dog in half and had like hot dog burger sliders. And it was actually like really good Ooh. to do it that way. Because it's like two burger buns when you just rip it cut it in half. Okay. All right. So I think we might have a new thing that'll stretch the burger farther. Interesting. We gotta stretch the burger farther. It's a very important thing. It's a it's a big initiative in the world. Right <laughs> I'm now. making shirts that say that, just so you know. I just maybe you could run on that campaign. I mean, t- November 2020 is gonna be interesting, Stephen. You know, I feel like we need a new voice. I oh mean, stretch God. the burger farther is definitely a better slogan than no more malarkey. <laughs> so funny. I just love Memorial Day grilling, cooking. There's something oh. so comforting about it to me, and it was a. Uh, we did run an old episode yesterday, so you know our audience still responded to what we're doing, but it was nice to have a little bit of time. You know, it's mm-hmm. those those days off during the week; they're rare, but when you get them, they feel like such a treat. You know? Yeah, it felt like a treat for sure. Did you enjoy it, Stephen? Yeah, it was nice. We Good. watched um, Bad Boys because Bree had never seen Bad Boys, so I've we watched that either. and ate, ate ate dinner, and then um, we watched. What Lies Beneath, which is like a Harrison Ford movie. Uh-huh. I had never seen that before. So like Brie chose one, I chose one, then Ryan next week will choose one. Nice. We did do um, a social distance movie night on the tennis court this weekend, which was fun for our staff. And uh, I have to say, Jeff picked Best in Show. And I hadn't seen it in two decades since it came out. And it was amazing. And my parents came out. And for my mom to stay up late and to watch it. And the next day, by the way... She was raving about it. My mom has not been right for a long time. And for her to actually be excited to do something, to stay there and to do it, and then to rave about it the next day, I, I think it's been at least a year since I've seen that mom. Makes me so happy. I Best in Show is such a anyone can watch it kind of movie. It's like a bring people together film. Mm -hmm. I was telling Laura as we were leaving. um, Your wife? My wife, yes. I kind of miss that PG-13 family comedy. You know, there's a lot of great comedies still, but they're always a hard R now. They're very, very edgy. Um, Imagine an R edgy movie on the tennis court. It would be fun. So all the neighbors are hearing people have sex (laughs) or like be dirty and gross. Like I was hoping nothing was going to happen i didn't know if it was an r or pg-13 to be honest and i was like oh my god i hope my neighbors don't want to kill me after this. Have you, you've seen american pie right yeah of course okay because yeah. that would be one to watch on the tennis court that yeah. one's great yeah no i think i'm gonna have to keep them pg oh we can watch frozen then i wanted to see gladiator out there yes but i mean that is gonna be so intense like i i really am try i try to be mindful for for reference guys we we started the movie and then Maria consistently walked up to the laptop and started hitting the volume thing down, down, and mm. then sat back down, then got back up and hit it up a little bit, then yes. sat back down, then hit it down a little bit. I was trying to be considerate 
within my rights, obviously, to have an event in my yard or whatever, but I still wanted to be considerate. Um, but it was super fun. And, uh, and I think we're going to be doing more of them. And I think that's what I'm going to do for my birthday. I think I'm going to do a social distance screening night. So I set it up where everybody who lived in the same houses could like hang in their areas. And then I remained the bartender for everybody. So everybody wasn't touching everything. And, you know, Kevin made bags of popcorn for everybody and gave them with the, the dog ball return thing, stick thingy, whatever you call that. He like passed them out. Everyone took their bag. It was cool. It was a really fun night. The fresh orange juice was a game changer. Yeah. It's real good. So I saw something the other night, and I have to show it to you guys, and I forgot to send it before the show, but I have to say it now anyway. So randomly, I decided to look in the morning. Uh, It was Memorial Day morning. Yeah. Yeah, it was yesterday morning. I looked at my cameras in the backyard and it was because I wanted to see if my dad had let the dogs out yet or if I needed a run down there. And I saw that there were some hits at 4 a.m. And I was like, 4 a.m.? I know we let Max out at this time and that time. No, that doesn't sound like anything. Let me check these. Guys, I'm staring at one of my camera angles of my backyard and in the sky is this whoosh, yellow star shooting star but it went like like in the stereotypical like rounded like a like a boomerang wow you know like on your emojis the star that's like it's a shooting star like the more you know yes the more you know exactly (laughs) i can see it exactly that it was so crazy i'm gonna text it to you guys right now was it like an owl um i was scared to put it on camera because i didn't want I mean, like on social media or anything, I don't want people to, it's kind of weird to show people your backyard, you know, your security cameras and stuff. Oh. Um, but I'm going to send it to you guys now so you can see. Do you want me to put it up on the screen? No, oh, no, no. Okay. No, you guys can just look at it on your phones individually. But if you look at the top kind of almost right middle, halfway through, you're going to see it's crazy. I'm watching now. Whoa. Right? Oh, my gosh. It blew me away. Now, two minutes before that, you see... (laughs) Wait, I should send you guys this one, too. Two minutes before that, you see almost like a bubble, right? Which could be like an apparition or like a a spirit. I don't know. Everybody I sent it to was like, it's like a spirit. You see it twice in this video, Maria. Really? Yeah. It goes from the right side. Oh my gosh. And then you see it across the left side. Yeah. I didn't see that. Near the end. Again, it comes after it it leaves the first time. It doesn't leave. It's like flying across your yard. Shut up. I'm going to die. Could this have to do with SpaceX? No. Okay. I don't think so. Oh! Oh my God, I didn't see that. Oh my God. Oh, and then there's like another thing that goes across the top in the middle right at the end. <gasps> I've seen this like 50 times, Stephen. I didn't see that part. Now I see Max out there. What's the second video? It's the bubble. The bubble. Wow, guys. Wait, there's two different stars. What, what the heck is going on here? Oh, the second one's light reflecting. Uh, okay, hold on. So. This is crazy, Maria. Where is the return, though? This is so strange. Because what I was telling you guys about happens halfway through. You see that, like, more you know. And then there's another one. Damn, I didn't wait to see the other part. Where it just comes from the top of the sky and then... <gasps> wow. Okay, tell me what you guys think that is. It's a shooting star, right? Like really low? The one almost looks like fireworks. It looks like it has a trail of smoke. Like it looks like it has smoke. But I might be wrong on that. I, it seems like, you know, when you have something move really fast and you have like a trail of it moving really fast... I don't know what your frame rate on those cameras are because it might have been something that moves 
so quickly that it like leaves a trail of light, right? Like it could have been a bug flying through a light yes. or something, but I don't know. I think it's kind of cool. I think it's a shooting star. I think there are UFOs out there now, and I believe that that bubble was a spirit because it was traveling around Max and then slowly moving around in odd ways. I'm telling you, it was so crazy. It, <laughs> that's then, wild. I've been like obsessed with my camera. So then um, Sunday, my dad was working on this like lattice thing he's fixing. And, uh, and he goes, Maria, I go, dad, look, there's a hawk. And he goes, yeah, they almost took me out. I was like, well, what? And so if you go to my TikTok, you'll see I did a video of my dad with the with that security footage. The, the hawks come flying over his head and he ducks down. And so, of course, it was like the don't shoot me pose. He was like, don't shoot me, don't shoot me. I was like, dad, for 76, you have amazing reflexes. Totally. I would have gotten eaten alive. Those <laughs> hawks are crazy out there. I looked out. I we were working on. We were, I forgot what I was doing. I think I was setting up the court for the movie night. And they're just chasing around birds in your yard. Like this hawk is just terrorizing your birds in your yard. It's crazy. I'm You're, Peter Rabbit better watch out. Oh, I already talked to the cock. <laughs> I had a conversation with it and I said, no touching the dogs and no touching Peter Rabbit. Like you can't. But I've been seeing a lot of creatures lately, huge grasshoppers, like the huge flying grasshoppers that are the size of my head. Um, I, I've been seeing a lot of stuff. I don't know what's going on, guys. But... I bet it's because of the pandemic a little bit. Like humans have kind of shut inside, so animals are repopulating nature a little yeah. bit. You oh, know. And then the worst. So Kevin and I went on a drive yesterday, and I was driving up Ventura Boulevard, and there was like a mouse or a rat in the road, and he was like, he didn't know what to do because it's three lanes of cars on this side, right, going north, and. Like he went under my car and I'm like, please God, please God, no, please God, no. And then I saw he made it and then the car hit him and I was like, ah. guys, it hurt my heart so bad for so long. And I was like, Kevin, what are we going to do? Like, do we pull around and go get him? And maybe he's still alive and he's hurting. And he's like, Maria. And I was like, the vet was right there. He goes, they're not going to take him. And I was like praying, just giving him safe passage. I'm like, God, please give him safe passage. Poor little guy. He's in a better place now. I believe it. Well, now for sure he is. I don't know how long it took him to get there. I hope it was fast. Oh, God. So painful. I'm telling you, it hurts me. Like, we, we have a lot of flies right now. And every time I kill one, which I, I really try not to, but when they're in the house, like, what am I going to do? I try to scoot them out. And then if they don't, I, I have a really hard time. Flies are, all bets are off for flies for me. I, they're, they're my worst enemy. I hate flies. Yeah, I will <laughs> not. They're my worst enemy. No mercy for flies. Mercy for spiders, mercy for other things, no mercy for flies. No mercy. All right. Well, have mercy on yourself. Did you start working out this weekend like we discussed? I did get a nice 30-minute workout on the elliptical. Good. Yes. Very good. As we talk about taking care of yourself with Dr. Pamela Peak, I wanted to make sure I asked you that before we get to it. So... Uh, as I said, Dr. Peek is a New York Times bestselling author known for her advances in studies in integrative and preventative medicine. She's a puke, a puke, a Pew Foundation scholar in nutrition and metabolism. That's funny. Uh, an assistant professor of medicine at the University of Maryland. She's been named one of America's top physicians by the Consumers Research Council of America. Dr. Peek, thank you so much for joining us. Well, hello there. Um, what a great day. Uh, it's just, you know, your two words, better together, couldn't have been more apropos. Oh, right? thank you. And you're wearing our color, yellow. I love it. I don't fool around, okay? <laughs> I know you don't. You know, I spent my morning listening to your TED Talks, and you are really funny. <laughs> I know many of my colleagues say, you know, if medicine doesn't really pan out, Stand up. Just try it. I mean, seriously, like you had everyone cracking up as if they were watching, you know, Dave Chappelle. Like it was really impressive. Well, you know, what's really interesting. I learned a long time ago, Maria, that if you're ever going to get a message across, if you if you don't engage people, forget it. Yeah. And if you talk about the whole world of health, it's lethally boring um, I mean, I could kill people with lectures on health because it's boring. <laughs> so what I learned to do was something different, and it's called 
edutainment. Mm. And so if I can engage you, and actually science shows that if you laugh, smile, and, and you really engage, you click with something that I just said, the chance that you'll remember that goes up a hundredfold. Wow. I wonder, conversely, if you make them emote and they cry, how that works. You know, it works. In all my, as you know, I, I spent a lot of time on the Discovery Channel. And one of the things we learned early on was, you know, um, uh, trauma and drama, you know, really tend to really gro you know, grab people. So the crying part of that is also when you really resonate deeply with someone and they go, wow, you just triggered some incredible memory, or maybe there's something that I haven't, you know, uh, really processed a hundred percent. And that reminds me and I need to do that. So it goes kind of both ways when you engage. Yeah, I would, I would imagine. I mean, it, it's like in any kind of art, you want someone to emote and connect in some way if they don't feel anything then you're you're screwed it's like the world of wrestling if the, nobody's booing or cheering you're screwed um <laughs> well i do the triathlon you do wrestling i'm a senior olympic triathlete and so you know when i hear all those people kind of cheering along as you're doing all those crazy ass things to yourself you know you're swimming trying praying not to drown and then you're on the bike please don't pop a tire <laughs> And then, you know, the only happy time is when you run, because what could happen, seriously, you know? And now that we're going to be running in the time of COVID, you can't even bang into each other because it's got to be six feet around. I know. I know. Have the, have the rules loosened up in Maryland where you are enough? You know, um, every single state is different, as you know. So there's 15 different ways of doing this opening up thing. Um, and I think that uh, the grand majority of uh, the politicians here, the governor, et cetera, are trying to be um, ruled and governed by uh, what we say in epidemiology, the statistics. And so right now, um, we could go outside, we, we play sports and back and forth. And I believe phase one of businesses now beginning to open up is going to occur within the next week. And so we're all champing at the bit uh, to kind of get out there. I will tell you one thing, it's very interesting. Uh, I'm on the board of directors of the American College of Sports Medicine and uh, as an athlete and also a, a, a scientist in the field. One of the things we've always done is just like yelled and screamed, please get out, be physically active and everyone just blows us off. Well, the wildest thing has happened with COVID and that is that since all you can really do <laughs> is go to the safest place around, which is outdoors, um, then people are out becoming, oh my gosh, 50 times more physically active. And by doing so, they're de-stressing, even if they don't fully realize that's exactly what's taking place in their body. So it's probably the best and most healthy thing they could possibly do. Wow. And we're going to talk about stress and how it affects the different genders and how we can create some coping skills. But I wonder, as a doctor, um, what are your thoughts as we reopen? Like, how will you approach life as, as the world reopens? What measures will you put into place for yourself? Because I think it's going to be very self-regulated um, to a degree. Obviously, we'll have some kind of parameters that our governor has put out for us, but how are you going to approach it? I'm curious. You know, this is going to be a new normal. Anyone who thinks we're going back um, is a fool. I mean, this is a new normal. It's also a slap in the head with reality. Um, you know, we've been praying for a million years for people to use better hygiene. Why? The flu. Mm -hmm. The flu kills people um, between 60 and 65,000 people die every flu season. Are we washing our hands for those little 20 seconds? Not. Um, are we even thinking about, you know, hand sanitizers and keeping your hands off your face and all those things. Now we're in a different world and you want to know something. It's going to be really good for us um, because that will help us in me. I'm, I'm very conscious of this now. 
um, to really be more mindful about just general hygiene. Do you know at the time of the Spanish flu in 1918, they had communal drinking cups, seriously. What? So you go into like a communal, like a little water fountain or something, and everybody uses the same beer cup. Oh, no, no, we ended that little thing with the Spanish flu. So oh. No, no, we're not doing that. And, you know, we're moving along. So that's a very important thing for me. The next one is uh, really now more fully appreciating personal connections because they're going to be redefined. You're, you're not going to be sitting, you know, at a WeWork somewhere right next to somebody and, and hanging out with them and, and interacting that way. Instead, it's we're going to be separated. So if we're going to be separated like that, how do we connect now? We have to redefine bonding, connecting. And I'll tell you one thing, you know, if you're not really grateful about friendships and connecting and things like that, then um, by definition, uh, you you didn't really fully experience these eight weeks of lockdown because that's going to be important. Make sense? Yeah. You know, I have a lot of friends who before this pandemic were very against hand sanitizer because it kills the good bacteria, they would say. What are your thoughts on that? Well, there's no question. You know, when you have a potentially lethal virus um, that we know, again, only a little bit about so far, uh, and that has really um, engendered um, uh, a lot of concern on the part of medical uh, uh, personnel and policymakers, then you know something, you wash your hands, you use the hand sanitizer um, when we know for a natural fact that our living environment, uh, door handles, you know, public restrooms, all the rest of it are just crawling with um, with dirt and all the rest of it and bacteria, viruses and other toxins. So it's a matter of balance. I think that, you know, your hands are very much um, going to be able to regenerate whatever bacteria and those wonderful little um, uh, uh, entities, everything from viruses, you know, very normal viruses, bacteria that help our skin they'll come back. That's not a problem. You're not like uh, taking a bath in, you know, in a, in a sanitizer. Um, but I think for the purposes of the fact that we use these for so much, we have to be much more mindful. And I, I, I really don't see any major problem with this whatsoever. Yeah. Well, let's get to stress um, because a lot of people are feeling it. Um, especially with COVID-19 and and being locked up for a few months and everything that's happened. Um, We had it before. We have it even more so in some ways now. Um, So what are the major kind of gender specificities um, that you see between how men handle stress and how women handle stress? Oh, I I always laugh, Maria. Um, I think about a visual And that is, uh, went to medical school in Michigan. And so I would always fly through O'Hare Airport. I always call it O'Scare because, (laughs) you know, there you go, right? And (laughs) enough said. Um, And here I am in the the, uh, red carpet club where, you know, I seem to inhabit during snowstorms and delays and whatever. And so let's just say there's a stressful situation, snowstorm or you just, you know, there's some problem at the airport. And I watch the stress around me and it's hysterical. The men all head for the bar, the women head for the food, okay? It's, you know, the women are like, you know, just chowing down on the cookies and the little nasty things they keep around and everything, the chocolate covered, God knows what. And, And the men are just chugging it down. It's very, very interesting. Men tend to numb with that Women numb, numb with food. Um, it's it's a very primal kind of thing. But um, women uh, physiologically are uh, you know ten times more likely to have generalized anxiety disorder. We get anxious, okay, uh, much more so than men. We don't just worry, Maria. We pre-worry. We worry about not worrying enough. 
And so if anything can be complicated even worse, right, we do it. We just do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Men, it's exactly the opposite. I'm being so generic here. Oh my gosh, but I'm having way too much fun. So I'm on a roll. (laughs) But the research does support this too, generally speaking. So what I'm doing is I'm actually messaging in a funny way what's already out there. Um, Men tend to try to keep things as simple as possible. So if I tell a man, okay, you know, you're, you're in kind of rough shape here. We got to, you know, like lose a few and get more physically active and eat more nourishing food, et cetera, et cetera. Their retort to me would be, okay, Dr. Pete, no problem whatsoever. What's the least I have to do to get the greatest investment? Brilliant question. What do women do? How can I complicate this to the point of never being able to get off first base Mm -hmm. because women are perfectionists and perfection equals paralysis. And so, you know, when I tell a guy, Hey, please take a walk, you know, just go in the neighborhood. It's a lovely neighborhood. Just take a walk. And they go, okay. You know, their shoes are mismatched. I, you know, they may forget their socks, whatever. They don't care what they look like. Women will be like, Oh my God, what do I wear? Everyone's going to see me. Who is everyone? Who is this everyone? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then women just seem to think that people are peeking, you know, down, you know, through their drapes and everything. And and they get very self-conscious. And before you know it, we spin ourselves into an anxiety, you know, typhoon, and we don't get off first base. So I always teach women to keep it simple and just do it. Come up with the simplest plan. Just do it and quit overthinking everything. So is that something that's innate in us as a gender? Or is that something that is a result of, you know, good girl syndrome and how we were raised to be perfect at everything, right? You got to be a good girl. You got to wear the perfect dress. You got to have your hair bows perfect. E all of the above. Got it. Okay. So whatever we had genetically you know, was just simply enabled further by what happened in society. Um, You know, as a caregiver, as the innate caregiver, of course, men are great daddies and, you know, the parenting thing, the rest of it. But honestly, at the end of the day, girlfriends, it's us. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Come on, let's just get serious. So we, we always have this, this little, you know, um, churning uh, piece of our brain that says, where are the children? where are whoever it is that we're caregiving we will caregive anything that comes within a hundred feet of us even if we don't know that person Mm -hmm. we want to caregive them and we worry about them yeah we just keep doing that thing and so that is built in the and you want that if you're mothering you know children parenting children you want to know where they are where are the little munchkins and there's like this sixth sense like I know the kids at school right now, but I have a bad feeling something just happened. Next phone, you know, hi, fell down, broke his elbow. It's just that thing in us. And it's very innate. Now, you don't have to have children to have this. I've watched women who've never had children, right, who are senior executives, who have 2,000 people under them, you know, in terms of, you know, their team and all the rest of it, and they mother them. They do it the same way. You know, where is Monica today? I haven't seen her, you know, like that. Makes sense. Yeah. So then let's distinguish the difference between normal stress and toxic stress. You know, when I wrote my first book, Five Fat After 40, um, this was the first book that really began to identify two forms of stress in a big way. And I actually coined the term toxic stress um, for lack of a better one. Uh, I got tired of people dissing stress. Don't you be dissing stress. Now, the good form of stress is, is kind of like what you and I are doing right now, Maria, right? We're on our tippy toes. We're mindful. We're paying attention. We're, we're sitting up straight. We're really, you know, getting into our work right now. It's a challenge. Can I, you know, really optimize my performance? These are all incredibly good things. These are good forms of stress that are productive, that allow us to evolve, to learn, to grow, to challenge ourselves. Rock on with that one. Okay. 
what's the kind of stress that will destroy you? I call it toxic stress. Just remember, when you feel helpless, hopeless, and defeated, those are the three guys right there, helpless, hopeless, and defeated, about any stress in your life. So Maria, you and I may have the same boss, right? And let's just say we're coworkers, and that boss, you know, uh, uh, is, is going to give us a performance review. Now you're up to it. You're like, okay, I'm on this one. Um, I've really shown that I've worked really hard and da, da, da. And you're feeling very, but at the same time, you're going to have this meeting with the boss and, and you want to be on your game. So what do you do? You sit down, you prepare and you plan and you know what you're going to say, right? What if I was someone who was feeling the same, you know, same situation, but I'm feeling this way. Nobody ever promotes me. I feel terrible. You know, this is kind of feeling like a no end job. Um, nobody listens to me. I don't think that my job is that good. Um, I think maybe my performance is not great. You know, I'm just going down this rabbit hole. Like, where's that going to get me? And at the same time, there are other forms of toxic stress that are so straightforward. Any form of abuse, any form of abuse is, is toxic stress. I don't care if it's verbal, sexual, physical, all the above, whatever. That's toxic stress. If you have a tragedy in your life, if you have a, you know, something that is a, a near uh, fatal situation or a close call with a medical diagnosis, all of those things are stressful, all right, and maybe way stressful. The question is, you know, can you regroup? We all have tragedy. We all have tough stuff in our life. The people who survive are the ones who can regroup. Charles Darwin, the great evolutionist, you know, said, it's not the strongest who survive and it's not the smartest who survive. It's those who can adapt and adjust who survive. So can you navigate it? Here's a challenge. Here's a tough one. So when we've studied 100-year-olds, and these are the big academic studies out of Harvard um, and University of Kentucky, and what we've been able to find is that these people are exquisitely resilient. And the essence of resilience is the ability to pivot and, and you know, to just take in whatever's happening, think about it, process, hit the pause button, and then regroup fairly quickly, relatively speaking, and then adapt and adjust and move on. You'll find the people, the companies, you know, individuals who do the best with this whole COVID situation are the ones who can pivot, are the ones who are immediately adapting and adjusting. Look at the fitness facilities all across the country. They're already moving all their, you know, equipment around inside the gym. Um, restaurants are doing the same and watch the ones who are really hitting it first. They're very resilient because they want to stay in the game, but the game is now within the jurisdiction of a new normal. How do you teach people to be resilient in the face of adversity? There's a, there's a very, very rich question. And, you know, some people, uh, have tremendous difficulty with this. I'll give you an example. People who have any addictive tendencies, whether it's food addiction, drugs, alcohol, gambling, sex, it doesn't matter. But people who have addictive issues are those people whose Achilles heel is difficulty with resilience. So that when they see a confrontation or adversity, they tend to cave to the crave. They Ooh, they're, cave they're like to a, the crave. That's good. Yeah, they cave to the crave, and up here, which is why I kept hitting the pause button, right behind your forehead is your prefrontal cortex of the brain. That's the CEO of the brain, and that literally helps you 
rein in impulsivity, irritability, impatience, those are the three I's, and then they allow you to strategize, organize, plan. So you've got to have a really intact prefrontal cortex. People who have addictive tendencies tend to miss some of that toolbox that you get up there. And so what I do when I help them with resilience is I teach them some of those tools. They have to be taught that which someone who does not have addictive tendencies doesn't have to hear. So, you know, they'll have to hit the pause button a lot more. They've got impulsivity. Mm. Their knee jerk response is to run, right? So when you saw the Boston bombing, who ran toward the bomb? The resilient people who said, I'm going to re rescue and no matter what, I'm going to make this work. And, you know, so Oof. when you think about resilience, you think about just give me any example in your life. Let's look at how you can adapt and adjust calmly, you know, in a way that makes you more mindful of every step instead of taking fathom leaps into fear. I love that. I think, you know, as I kind of quickly am kind of, you know, jogging back mentally that I've, I've had a foundation for it and then sometimes forgotten it, but then built it back up and, and have been consistent with it now. Um, and I think it does, I think it really is important to build that emotional toolkit. And that's what I did when I realized I didn't have it anymore, because I do think that you can have it and then have it beaten out of you too, right? If you have enough toxic stress and toxic environments that just eventually get you, and that's what happened to me, I, I was not even myself anymore. Like all of the, you know, the bubbles were gone, the light, all of these things were just... I was like, wait, who is this person? And then you have to build that back and get more tools and, and you can become more resilient. And I like, I like hearing that, um, that you believe that it is possible to, to learn it as well, because I think there isn't one person out there that isn't going to face uh, tough times. And you also need to know that you're not always going to be resilient. You might need a little assistance at times. Well, you know, here's the deal. Let's let's just again, you know, do another reality check. Um, life is is filled with countless challenges, good, bad, and otherwise. But they're challenges. To expect otherwise is to be unrealistic. So the more you put it out there, you know, uh, you have to say to yourself, um, "Good grief." Uh, just sort of almost woman up and man up, wake up in the morning. First thing is you open your eyes and you say to yourself, oh my God, I'm still here. That's good, mm -hmm. right? And <laughs> then you go through your little litany of gratitude. So I'm so grateful for, fill in the blank. And then sit straight up in bed and say, bring it on. You know, kind of like grow a little hair on your chest. And even, you know, do you always feel that way? Of course not. But when you do, it feels kind of cool. And then you start the day. And then for every single crazy thing that gets thrown your way from left field, right field, doesn't matter, you say to yourself, okay, hit the pause button again. No impulsivity. Don't react. You want to respond, not react. And then you say to yourself, how can I do this a little bit differently? Um, what are some of the new rules of the road? Oh, you're someone who likes to get angry all the time. When you get angry, you lose. You lose control, you lose everything. But when you're able to rein it in, take a deep breath, which by the way, physiologically is very cool, because when you do that, taking deep belly breaths stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system. And when, it, when you do that, it stimulates calm because outcome from the brain stem, right? Um, beta endorphins. And beta endorphins are innate morphine. So you're kind of, you know, living off your own high. It calms you down. At the same time, it reduces heart rate, blood pressure, and stress hormone. So 
a simple thing like a breath. There's power in breath. It's not just some earthy, crunchy moment. Mm -hmm. This is the real deal. And then when you just sit back and say, you know, no matter what hits me, I've got it like a, you know, a little standard operating procedure here I can use. Stop, hit the pause button. Let me think about that. Do you always have to get back to someone immediately at that moment? No, I'll get back to you on. I, I need to think about that a little bit before you say something you're going to regret. Yeah. And, you know, these are simple tools. Does that make sense, Maria? Yeah, absolutely. I, I've been teaching a lot of my friends that uh, that little stress management tool all the time. It's like, let me get back to you or, you know what, that sounds great. Let me think about it and get back to you or whatever the form that will work for them because we get pressured into things as if we have to give an answer right away and we don't. No, but we as women, you know, we are, we're pleasers, you know, and so when someone says, hi, um, please, Maria, could you please be on this, you know, crazy ass committee that has nothing to do with anything. And because I would really love for you to be on it. Meanwhile, your plate is like this full and you need one more thing, like a hole in the head, especially something like that. You know, women struggle with saying no. I usually tell women, you know, to grab like a little, you know, like a mirror or something and go, no, no, um, no. And, and just practice. <laughs> just going, you know, that was so lovely of you to invite me to be on this committee. However, um, at this point right now, that doesn't work for me. It's one of the best sentences you'll ever learn, Maria. That doesn't work for me. All right. Because that presumes then that you know what works for you. So I'm going to take you over to a lovely, you know, boutique and I'm going to, you know, ask you to wear this dress. So you're going to put this dress on, you come out and, you know, it's puce colored, all right? And, and you're standing there and you're going, oh man, you know, loser, this is never going to work. So you look at me and you say, you know, listen, thanks very much for recommending this dress. Um, however, it doesn't work for me. And so I'm going to, you know, find something that does. And, and who died? But you know what happens is women become their worst enemies, not only because they want to please someone, but also the other woman becomes annoying because she'll say, oh, come on, you, you can't be on this committee with me, please. Mm -hmm. you know, and I need you so much. And this is where you have to be strong, women. Okay, you have to go, well, you know, hey, listen, you're getting pushback now. Listen, hey, you know, again, I'm just so happy you invited me. However, it's just not going to work for me. See, if you push back, it's like teaching a barking dog to stop barking. You know, you just have to stay firm, right? Then they'll get the message loud and clear that you're not a pushover and you're not a, you know, a welcome mat. And, and you, you can, you have your own limits and boundaries. Women just absolutely blow off their own limits and boundaries. They'll just drop everything they're doing immediately, no matter how important it is, right? And to be able to give it up for someone else. Men will be like this. You'll say, honey, um, could you help me on Tuesday night? No way. Playing racquetball with the guys. You know, what? Um, you know, there's the limit and boundary. Yeah. It's, it's, you're like, wait a minute. Um, but that's the way they do it. They hold on to that. Mm -hmm. And and it's just like a given thing. It's almost like, yes, I know, I know, entitlement. Women, they just give it away cheaply, freely. Don't do that. That's like spending your own body dollars all day long, money, yep. just flying out of your wallet. Instead of holding on to that and using it very, very carefully and strategically. Mm hmm. You would love my outgoing email. I have an automatic email response, Dr. Peak. That's like, what I does really it say? I want to hear it. Basically <laughs> says due to, um, you know, an overwhelming inbox and, you know, my mom's health, uh, I'm only checking email from, you know, sporadically something like that. And if you have an urgent request, here are the people you can reach out to and, you know, via category. Right. And thank you you know, for, for taking the time to read this, because I realized I was a slave to everyone's requests of me and everyone's demands. And, you know, I'm playing Pac-Man with emails all day, just trying to be the good one who's responding to everybody and timely and making sure I do everything for everyone. And, 
you know, my mom got brain cancer. I got a brain tumor and I was like, yeah, not doing this anymore. Not interested. And now what it does is it frees me up. I've made certain people important. So they go to the top. I get to see those important emails that I need to see for my work every day. And then if I so choose to go through the other ones, if I so have time, I will. And then I also have a built-in response that says, you're, you're not expecting a response anyway, so I don't need to respond to people. It's really freeing. Well, you know, um, as a physician, one of the things I've always uh, been so deeply impressed with, um, both on my own personal level, let alone, you know, my patients and back and forth is um, how uh, a medical condition affecting either that person or someone dear to them will literally reshape their life. Mm -hmm. That you reprioritize completely. Yep. And um, suddenly the stuff that you thought was so terrifyingly, you know, crisis and oh my gosh, I have to drop everything. No. Now, all of a sudden, it becomes a lot easier to be able to say, no, not happening. Um, and, and to be able to say things gracefully, like, I, I just can't do that right now. Um, I actually am caregiving my my mother, and uh, that's it. And women over-apologize. Yes. You don't have to. You, have to feel, you feel like you have to write the novella as to why you can't do something. And, you no, know, I've always admired it. the women who are like, sorry, can't. And you're like, oh, oh, wow. Okay. All right. Uh, and then you have to kind of deal with, you know, your feelings about the response, but I'm like, well, they have boundaries. Like I need to learn those. Why they're living their happy kind of filled full lives. And I'm sitting here stressing that I have to be everything to everybody. And so, you know, making these, um, making these choices has freed up a lot of stress and anxiety in my life. Yes. And how, how have you regrouped yourself, Maria? You oh. know, um, you went through a double dose of a major slap in the head. Mm -hmm. um, and there it was. I mean, your precious, beloved mother, um, who you're so close with, my, my mentor at the National Institutes of Health in my laboratory is Greek. His oh. last name is Krusos. And then one of the other guys is Papalopoulos. I'm going to say that wrong. I always say it wrong. <laughs> so I have a very special place in my heart um, for Greece, needless to say. Oh, but yeah. here you are. You know, I've seen pictures of you and your mom. And, you know, you have such a terrifically powerful bond. And then, boom, out of the blue, you have your own, you know, journey. So how did you make sense of that, Maria? Yeah. I am. Um, I don't know why I just got so emotional. Oh boy. I'm good at this. Damn. <laughs> um, I there think it's, it's resilience. It's, it's knowing how to kind of thrive. Um, you know, with my mom, it was really painful because, you know, you get hit in the head, like you said, and you're like, Whoa, this life altering moment. I often go back to photos of the day before that diagnosis and look back and be like, Whoa, life was so simple and you didn't even realize it. And so when I got mine, I, it was just kind of a shock, like, oh, okay, well, this is hilarious. Like how, how in the world could this possibly happen? And so when you have something that's like that ridiculous, and that's what it was in my head, it was like absolutely insane. I was like, okay, I think this is happening for a reason. This is happening for me, not to me. This is a gift. I had done all my Tony Robbins seminars and built my toolkits. And so I was able to handle it and, um, and then decided that this was going to be a big, you know, pivot for me in my life and to really follow the things that, um, bring me true joy and make me happy and not just doing everything and, um, and learning how to de-anxiety and de-stress my life with emails like that, or even just the pressures that you put on yourself, you know, if, a friend has a baby, I'm not going to need to be the first person to send flowers. They might not get them for a month or two months or three months. They'll get them eventually when I can do it without it creating undue stress on my day because I'm doing everything I can in each day. And that's that. And so, you know, I started this show where I'm continuing the journey to get better in all areas of my life. And, um, yeah, it's changed me tremendously. 
Well, you know, what you did was you took a, a, a real two milestone events and you went through transformation. Mm -hmm. You transformed yourself. You know, mind you, there are people who would just wear it on their sleeve forever and they would allow a medical diagnosis to um, define them. Instead, what you do is you always look for the lessons and, and you look for the opportunities for growth to evolve mm -hmm. and to transform. And sometimes, you know, these milestones absolutely strip it down and make it bare so that all the things, the trappings, the things you thought were ever so important and you got tied up and you had no idea, all of a sudden things are looking real raw. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you grow. And that's a beautiful thing to watch. So then what you're doing with this fabulous show, which I just think it's the best idea and I love the title. Thank of you. It. I'm, I'm like totally behind it here. And I'm so proud to be a piece of it here is to um, be of service to people. What you're doing is you're teaching. This is a learn, you had a learnable moment, and you're still having them. Mm -hmm. And now you're having a teachable moment. See one, do one, teach one. Yeah. So you saw one with your mom. You did one without even realizing it was gonna happen. And now you're having this teachable moment and you continue to evolve as you learn more and more when the student is ready, the teacher appears. It's a very famous Zen saying. And that's exactly what happened to you, Maria. Um, many people would not have gone that direction. They would have, you know, just cowered and said, what else is going to happen to me and gone down the toxic stress rabbit hole. But you decided not to do that. Of course, you had a moment to grieve and to feel oh my God, and, and you have to process all this because, I mean, this is like a real, you know, a real kick in the you know what. Mm -hmm. And then you step back and you take a deep, deep breath. Again, there's that breath. And you process it in a new way. What's my new normal now? A great appreciation for every breath I take, for the opportunity to have those breaths. Mm -hmm. And then to enjoy my mother, like there's no tomorrow. How is mom? She's doing really well. Uh, we got another kick to the, you know what, in September, her tumor came back with a vengeance, but now we, we beat it down. It's like a hint on the MRI. You barely see anything. So, um, so I'm really grateful for that, but you know, what's crazy is I'm hearing you talk and, and I've said this before, but it really is sticking out right now as you speak. What I went through, I used to say to people in the last three years almost, is how do I show people the way when without having to have that crisis, right? Like how do I teach them the things that I've learned and show them how to apply this kind of new mentality and, and give them that gift without them having to suffer? And is it possible? And then this COVID crisis happens. And look, everyone is being forced to reevaluate their lives, maybe rebuild, um, think of what's important, which is our health and our well-being and, the lo and our loved ones. And, you know, I was watching an interview this morning in the Today Show with J-Lo, and she's talking about how she loves being able to be home for dinner with her family. You know, you think of someone like her, She's a massive superstar. She's been working nonstop for the last two decades easy. And you wonder how is she going to apply these lessons and how is everyone going to apply these lessons and keep the things that they have found to be so important in this time. So it's almost like everyone got a collective brain tumor in a sense. And now I was talking to Jeff earlier. I said, Jeff, we want I want someone to talk to where we can really figure out how people can identify those moments, those things that they want to carry over, and what is the plan to make sure they hold on to them? Because as I've spoken at different events and throughout the country, other people would come up to me and say, I had a life-altering moment and I didn't stick to the lessons. I went back to normal. So 
maybe you can answer that question is how can we identify those things that we want to keep and then how do we keep them in in this new normal that's going to come well you know excellent excellent question um it was interesting um back about um oh gosh about 10 years ago um i wrote a book called fit to live and my i remember my um publisher said to me um you know dr peak you're way ahead of your time hmm. um, and what i did was i said in it are you ready are are you fit mentally physically spiritually every which way to be able to handle whatever life gives you. So I'm not talking about, are you fit to live, you know, with big muscles? I wasn't talking about, you know, fitting into those skinny jeans. I mean, it's all special, but it happens, whatever. The bottom line, the bottom line was, are you literally fit enough to save your own life, let alone someone else's? And the book took off and, um, uh, and became my Discovery Health series called, Could You Survive? And here we create all these scenarios like, you know, drowning, burning building. We shot it in LA, which is where our production company is. It was a riot. And, you know, what we did, and this is an answer to your question, I learned a lot watching, you know, I hosted the show, watching everyone go through this experience and, and the aha moments. You know, uh, we deliberately had terrific uh, diversity um in age size body type whatever so it wasn't a bunch of skinny people or a bunch of people who were clearly overweight it was a mix and the skinny people are like oh i got this you know until i asked them to run up 30 flights of stairs to save their life Ooh, that didn't go down well <laughs> and then it was a humiliating you know kind of like because you're kind of like oh i expect the person who's heavy to not make it up there but you know i got this no you didn't you weren't even beginning to be prepared and you also had a badass attitude. <laughs> so here, here's the way I look at it. You know, when you're looking at this whole COVID thing and the rest of it, it's so funny. I feel like I've come full circle since the show came out and, and my book was written because seriously, I could have written a pandemic in there too. It's just, you can't see anything really. Um, but there it is. What, what lessons can you learn here? All right. Lesson number one, what are your priorities? Just what are they? You sit down now, and if you tell me, I just want to get rich and I want to make a lot of money, okay, did you really say that? I don't think so. All right, what you need to be doing is getting down and telling your true truth. What is the quality of your friendships? <gasps> No friends to call because maybe we haven't spent enough time doing that. And now that you're in lockdown, you have no one to talk to. Think about that for just a minute, right? What were those connections really all about? Um, you know, you, you, you suddenly look at yourself physically, and, and this is COVID especially. I'll tell you what COVID did. What it did was the emperor has no clothes here when it comes to the health of the American people, let alone people in other countries. I'm not gonna to speak to other countries, although I could. But in the United States of America, right? Our health isn't that great at all. We have, true, we have an epidemic of chronic illness, the mass majority of which could be reversed and ameliorated mm -hmm. by lifestyle habits. And oh boy, are we getting a heck of an eye opener on this one now? When we, you know, physicians like myself and lifestyle medicine praying, please, would you just listen to me? Whole Foods, stop this junk and the rest of it, and just go out and take a walk. You don't have to join the Olympics. Would you take a moment to meditate, to pray? Would you take a moment to call family and friends and bond and connect? Would you do that? Would you get some sleep? How about sleep? And all these things. But we got blown off. We're like, ah, eh, you know. And now little Mr. COVID comes along. And, and COVID is merciless. It says if you have an increased level of inflammation in your body, that's called something, it's a, we have all new vernacular now, the inflammasome throughout the entire body. Okay. So if you have 
um, increase inflammation from chronic diseases, illness, things like that. And that includes everything from high blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, all those things that go hand in hand with that stress. Oh, if you knew what stress did to the inflammasome, I'm talking about toxic stress now, all right? That, you know, again, helpless, hopeless, defeated. Then what you're doing is if you don't address those issues, you might as well lay down a, a, a red carpet welcome mat to any kind of virus, bacteria, infection, everything, you know, all the way down to, you know, illnesses like cancer, all the way down there, because it makes it easier for your body mm -hmm. to just, you know, fall apart. Your immune system is absolutely inextricably connected to all of these lifestyle factors. Have we got the message yet? Yep. Absolutely. So right on. And I think it's, it's, um, it's very apparent. <laughs> like you said, it's very obvious now. And, uh, you know, and also when you think about in the beginning of this, I know for us, I started grabbing more plants, uh, more stuff to plant in the garden. I was like, what if the food chain supply is disrupted? Like we need to be able to grow our own food. And so we started growing our own stuff. And, um, and then thinking about the fact that we'd gotten away from gardening a little bit, like even though we had one, we weren't really eating from it very much. And gosh, really fresh food is going to give us the energy that we need to carry through our days. Instead, we're reaching for multiple coffees or, you know, something else. And so I think, uh, with the, the massive amount of autoimmune diseases that we're all suffering from out there and knowing that that is a horrible, horrible, um, uh, situation with COVID, um, any kind of pre-existing condition is, is a terrible thing for COVID. Then you, you realize, well, I guess if I really focused on an anti-inflammatory diet, that probably would help. Um, so I think, I think it's very obvious that we have to make a lot of lifestyle adjustments and, um, and we didn't get to talk much about nutrition, but you know, fit to live. I think we need to have a whole episode on, on that at some point, because, um, that's really what I'm doing here too. It's like when you're sick, you know, the illness is, is the result of something and we're not figuring out what that something is. And it could be emotional, spiritual, physical. There's it, to me, you have to attack all of those. And so I help families through their brain tumor journeys on the side. And, you know, then in, inevitably other friends will call when their family members get cancer of some kind, because I think the lessons I've learned are applicable in all areas. It's like, here are kind of the holes in the system that we need to plug because we do need to think about the fact that nutrition is a huge component of this, right? Hippocrates said, let food be thy medicine. I'm not saying let's ad abandon medicine. No, we're doing the chemo. We're doing these things, but let's balance the body out. Let's handle the emotional component of this. What has led us to this place where the body just did break down so much? Let's focus on the spiritual, the, you know, the growth in that area to help build that part. Like, let's look at these buckets and fill all of them up so that you can get well. Getting well isn't just taking the pill. You have to get well in all of these areas. And it sounds like that's what you have written about. And I haven't gotten to read the book, but I will before our next, um, our next, if I should assume, our next chat. <laughs> um, but I think that's a really important thing that people don't realize. It, it is a 360 view. No, there's absolutely no question about that. You know, it's so funny. Um, since I'm living on Zoom these days, um, uh, and as, as well we all are, um, I just got off of Zoom a couple hours ago uh, with the um, former president of Costa Rica, um, Jose Maria Figueres, um, who is probably one of the leading um, activists now uh, in the whole issue of uh, climate change, ocean health. And if you look at, if you've ever been to Costa Rica, I and have. I, it's one of my, oh my God. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of my most favorite places on this this incredibly wounded planet. And um, I listened to him talk about uh, how it's so ingrained in his culture to eat 
uh, food that you have cooked that, you know, you see those beautiful greens. My God, if you looked at the jungles there and what they grow and um, I just didn't want to leave. I was like holding on to the airport. No, <laughs> don't make me go. Um, I just couldn't wait to come back. And interestingly, you know, we, we talk about the plant base and, and the excellent nutrition while I was there, you know, the book, the blue zones, it's all about, um, the centenarians all around the world. There are certain little places in the world where, uh, there are hundred year olds and people well North of a hundred, like Okinawa, for oh, instance, yeah. Virginia, um, in the United States, Loma Linda with the seventh day Adventists say for instance, but there's one Costa Rica. Um, uh, and it's in a beautiful little town called Nicoya. And I was so fortunate, uh, several years ago when I was last there to meet, uh, literally the most famous person in Costa Rica in terms of centenarian, her name was Panchita Cochilla and Panchita at that time was 109. And, and she, there were seven generations of her family alive at one time. And when I came up to her beautiful little place, which was interesting, since there are no addresses, it's just hang a left at the cows and the right, you know. And I was with my interpreter in a Jeep and I was getting a real kidney jangling there. And we finally got up there. And ironically, the area where uh, the centenarians live is called uh, Mansion, which means mansion, which is the last thing you'll ever find there. These are the just little simple abodes. And here she is beautiful little gardens, herbs, chickens, you know, and just absolutely exquisite right in the jungle. And um, she always smiled. What I never saw was I never saw any processed food and see like bags and boxes and cartons of junk. Instead, people are just cooking away. Whatever you found out there, honey, you're eating. And, you know, and then they make up for all the rest or they buy their little chicken and know back and forth and really at the end of the day that's where it's at mm -hmm. so when you ask these hundred year olds which i did with panchita you know i said so you know what's the big you sound like an idiot when you ask these questions like what's the secret of your success <laughs> 109 years old and and she just looks over at you know at her little oven she goes like that enough said yeah you know <laughs> so you know, when you talk about nutrition, and we will in our next episode, yeah. Doctors in the House, um, you know, really at the end of the day, it's keeping it so simple and basic and joyful, you know, and you don't have to be a Julia Child to thoroughly enjoy putting together something that just is the absolute best. Yep. Totally agree. We did that uh, this weekend, you know, it's... It, it, it isn't hard. We've just become accustomed to packages and boxes and things like that. Because, Easy. Yeah, no we've, time. Yeah, Don't we've made our time. lives easier, right? But really, we've made them harder um, because, of course, inevitably we get sick. Um, Dr. Pamela Peak, thank you so much for chatting with me and for sharing um, everything that you did, we are going to have to have you back. Cause I have so many things here that I did not get to that I wanted to get to, but we had such an even better conversation. I feel like, um, in the path that we went on and I hope people, um, really enjoy the great takeaway that you gave us. Well, my, a big shout out to you for, you know, putting together this opportunity to be able to help other people, um, and to touch lives because you are every single time you're on air, Maria. So kudos to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, guys, if you want to know more about Dr. Pamela Peak, you can find her on social media at Pam Peek, P-E-E-K-E-M-D. Um, we're going to put that in the summary of the show. And Dr. Pamela, we'll see you soon. Okay. Thank okay. you. Um, she has written so many books, but Fit to Live is going to be my, uh, my next read. I'm very excited. I feel like I'll kind of whiz through that so fast. Yeah, she was cool. Yeah, I saw. I, I now I didn't remember until the very end that you had a question. Yeah, because I because we started I, flowing and then I didn't even realize how much time went by. It was hard to like think of a time to jump in because it was like one thing to the next thing to the next thing to the next thing because yeah. she knows what she's talking about. Yeah, I was really what I was curious about is like things that like 
because she mentioned the taking a breath like that's a physical thing that you can do to help relieve stress Mm -hmm. and for me it's it's not the i i get like this pressure that builds up from not even the what is it toxic stress versus the non-toxic it's just when so much is going on you get this pressure and you just need some kind of physical way to get it out yep meditation meditation for me doesn't feel physical though like i'm talking about like when you feel like you want to put a fist through a wall like what are things aside from breath work that you can do that are more healthy like is it is there a walk like do you need to like just punch a pillow or is it no no i think um i mean if you had a punching bag and you could do that it's physical activity Mm -hmm. right like you want to motion equals emotion we've talked about that before tony's taught us that Motion equals emotion um, is really important. So for you, if you don't want to just stop and like let the air out of the balloon. So if I'm getting really hot, which doesn't happen a lot anymore, I would stop and I would just sit. And you can call it meditation. You can call it what you want. Just sit and shut your brain off for a few minutes. Even five minutes, just sit still, close your eyes and think of something that makes you happy. Think of, you know, your dog's face. Think of a butterfly. Think of uh, whatever it is. That is steam, you know, the kettle's exploding thing just starts to come down, come down, come down. And then you feel better. It hap- it, it works. It just absolutely works. Um, you don't have to do any official meditation or anything like that. You can do that, or you can go for a walk or you can, you know, do 20 jumping jacks. You just got to change the energy in your body. Um, but what I think you do is what I used to do is you pile on. Then you're like, no, I got to white knuckle this shit. You got to keep going. Got to get it done. And then you get a brain tumor. So don't do it. (laughs) Oh, man. Um, Well, we'll have her back, Stephen, and you can ask the question then. She's got this huge oeuvre of work, and um, I can tell she really enjoyed today, Maria, so she'll come back. Oh, yeah, she was awesome. I really, really enjoyed that. So thank you guys for joining us. Um, Somehow I'm trying to make these shorter, and they're going longer. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but um, thank you for being with us uh, every day. If you um, would join us at Patreon, we would greatly appreciate it. We have a great episode coming up for that. If you haven't already, comment, rate, subscribe. Um, Brandy, our, our friend in the chat, is uh, monitoring that and helping us with that. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, yeah, let us know what you guys think. Let us know what you want more of. Um, go over to iTunes and hit a little thing there for us and send us a little uh a little message of love of something um tomorrow vanderpump rule star shana shea is going to be here um hopefully meredith will come back we'll have a little bit of fun tomorrow as well in the meantime you can follow us at maria menounos at pam peak md at Stephen lemieux photo at jeff crane graham and remember be nice people make good choices and be present 